Hi, biology class. This is Mr. Yago again. We're talking about 11.4 factors affecting plant growth. This is going to be kind of a lot of information. I don't want you to freak out. Just take your time, jot things down. But mainly what we're going to look at today <clears throat> is what affects plant growth. We're going to determine how and when a plant will grow. We're going to define what a PGR is. And we're going to look at extracellular versus intracellular growth factors. Extra, meaning outside of the cell. Intra, meaning inside. And we're also going to end with looking at a bunch of chemicals that can be used as either a stimulant or an inhibitor of growth. So stick with me, stay with me, let's give it a shot. <clears throat> Alright, first things first. What determines when and how plant organs grow? The eliminating factor is always proteins. Proteins are vital for the structure of any plant and as well as us as an animal. The other thing that we're going to break this up into is hormones and PGRs. PGRs is what I mentioned before, and plant growth regulators is what a PGR is. And to regulate something means essentially deciding if it's going to grow or not grow in the plant world. Okay, so proteins will help determine when it can grow, and these proteins are going to be things like hormones and things like plant growth regulators. So these two items right here are considered proteins. Now, let's take a look at what this means. We all know that genes, which are segments of DNA, will provide the primary control out of what out of how these plants are going to grow because that's how it works with animals. We're going to read those genes, we're going to have what we call express them and make things, okay? But how do different bits of genetic material information direct a cell's growth and differentiation? That's one of the things that I can hopefully answer by the time we're done here. All right, let's look at some of these factors. Factors that act as cues for gene expression. And again, gene expression, all you really need to understand is that the gene, the DNA, is read, and that is going to code for a certain protein. Proteins make you. So we're going to read the DNA and make you. So we have some environmental factors here. These are things that are going to happen outside of the cell. These would be extracellular things. Some major ones that I want you to jot down. Temperature, that is a big one. Night length, light, minerals, especially in the soil, gases in the air, and water. Now take a second, if you can think back to photosynthesis. How important are these things? Well, we need light. That gives us our sunlight. And if your night length is very, very long, then that means that your day length is very, very short. Another one is going to be gases. Plants use CO2 to essentially run the processes of photosynthesis. If that is not present, can't run that process. And then finally, one of the most important things that we all think about with plants and how we can affect their growth is water. So these six things are important environmental factors. Now, we have intracellular things, factors that occur inside the cell. Chemical signals from other plants is a biggie. Plants that are next to each other can actually prevent themselves from growing. A great example that I can always think of is take a look at a pine tree. Underneath it, you'll notice that there is always a perfect circle of either grass that's dead or just plain dirt. The needles of a pine tree are extremely acidic, and that acid is going to create an environment that's not healthy for grass to grow. So the next time you're around a pine tree, take a look underneath it, you'll notice that that is a definite chemical signal. Activities of neighboring cells, that would be another factor that's going to affect growth, and that could be cells with inside of the plant. PGRs, which we're going to look at in more detail, so for now just write down PGRs and feel free to abbreviate that, you don't have to write down plant growth. And then uh, obviously a big one is nutrition. That's huge for us, it's also huge for plants. They need certain things like nitrogen and potassium, just like we do. All right, now this is something that I don't think you necessarily need to write down, but many of the effects of these factors are signaled by the PGR, which we just mentioned before. So feel free not to write down that top part. What I do want you to write down is kind of a definition of what a hormone is. In us as animals, we would consider an orm a hormone something like testosterone or estrogen. And when those are present in our bodies, especially when we're going through the processes of puberty, it's going to help us grow. So with that in mind, think of how a hormone is going to affect a plant. 
all right? It's gonna help it grow as well. So botanists, which are basically crazy plant people who are really super boring, much more boring than I am right now, have identified five major classes of interacting PGRs that influence growth and development. So with this said, I'm gonna go through these on kind of more of an individual basis on the next slide. But these compounds may cause different effects in the parts of the plant at different times or in different concentrations. And essentially what that's speaking to is the fact that these PGRs are gonna have different effects on the plant. All right, here's our first PGR. And how I want you to list these is by stimulants and inhibitors. I'm gonna start with stimulants. And as you can imagine, if this is something that stimulates growth, it's gonna essentially have it growing. And the first one I want you to jot down is something called auxins, A-U-X-I-N-S. And I'm gonna go through a bunch of bullet points. Feel free to make it easy on yourself. You don't have to write everything down, but look at some of the important things here. Uh, this is something that I don't necessarily need to write down, but the first PGRs to be identified in the whole entire world were auxins. And the Greek word auxine means to grow. So you can kind of see where we derive these things. Not vitally important information, but kind of good to know to help you understand that. Now, where are these produced? These are produced in the apical meristems, which are going to be found in the plant stem. Now, they're gonna stimulate receptive cells of other meristems, causing the cells to elongate. Now, if a cell elongates in a plant, to elongate is to basically get longer. So you're gonna see growth. Now, where are they found? As we mentioned before, they're produced in the apical meristems, but they're found in the embryos of seed, seeds young leaves, basically, okay? And at extremely low concentrations, auxins promote elongation of roots. So this is something that I definitely want you to jot down. At extremely low concentrations, auxins promote elongation of roots. However, at very high concentrations, they will inhibit elongation. So this is something that's very important to understand. Low versus high concentrations of the stimulant. Some will cause growth, others will not. Next on the list is naphthalene acetic acid. Feel free to abbreviate NAA. NAA is going to be responsible for stimulating root formation on stem and leaf cuttings. And it's used by gardeners to increase the number of fruits on a tomato plant. So you can already see where this is going to be extremely beneficial. So by essentially increasing the number of fruits, you're making the plant better to harvest. So this is used a lot with farmers. It is also used to prevent buds from sprouting on potato tubers during storage. So you can imagine, if you've ever had potatoes that have been sitting in your fridge for a very long time, they develop those eyes. Not really harmful, you can pull them off, but they're kind of unsightly and it makes you feel like maybe it's expiring. So one thing we do is we put NAA on these potatoes and it's gonna prevent that from happening. Another stimulant is gabberlins. What's unique about that is they are synthesized, which again, synthesized means to make, in the apical parts of stems and roots, and they stimulate stem elongation. So the previous one we looked at dealt with leaves. This one's dealing more with stems. And as you can imagine, if you increase the stem, you're gonna essentially increase the height that that plant can grow. Now, germinating embryos produce gibberellins that stimulate the transcription of genes that'll essentially code for digestive enzymes in the endosperm. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you put gibberellins on a plant, they can cause some dwarf plants to grow to the height of normal varieties. So usually when we have issues with growth and nutrients, you're gonna put some of this on the plant and it's gonna cause it to essentially grow in a much better height. Think of this as kind of a performance enhancing drug of the plant growth of factors. Now, here's an application in the real world. Brewers, not the Milwaukee brewers, but essentially brewers who make beer will use this to increase the alcohol contents of beer. And this increases the amount of sugar produced in the malting process. So that's another extension of where we can see these factors. Whew, getting close, almost done. Cytokinins, their job is to promote cell division and organ development, usually work in combination with auxins and other hormones to regulate the total growth pattern of the plant. Now, they're produced mainly in the roots, but are transported throughout the rest of the plant. And they're gonna move through those veins. Okay, we talked about venation in plants, and this is an example of how they would move throughout the plant. 
Now, these are necessary for stem and root growth as well as chloroplast development. So think to yourself, what is the benefit of maybe growing more chloroplasts? Well, that's one of the major functioning parts of a plant that allows for photosynthesis to occur, which is used to help make the plant energy. So if you mess with the development of the chloroplast, you mess with the total energy of that plant, and eventually you'll affect the plant growth. Lastly, they are used to stimulate the growth of lateral branches and inhibit the formation of lateral roots. So lateral means out to the side. So you can imagine if you're trying to get depth in the tree or in the plant, that's what these would do. Ah, two slides left. Now we're going to focus on the inhibitors. Now to inhibit something means to prevent it from growing. And I have the two inhibitors labeled up here at the top, as you can see, abscisic acid and ethylene. And we're going to focus on abscisic acid first. It's a tough one to say. Um, there's the formula, C15H20O4. So it is carbon-based, very similar to your sugars, example, C6H12O6. Um, and it's naturally occurring PGR that is synthesized in response to dry conditions. So in a dry condition, we're going to use this and essentially become a PGR, a growth regulator. And it's going to stimulate the closing of stomata, protecting plants against water loss. So a lot of you are probably thinking, wow, inhibitors, it's going to basically prevent the plant from growing. But that's not always true. In this case, it's going to prevent the plant from dying. So if in a drought period, you're going to see this being produced. And again, it naturally occurs in the plant. And it's going to close the stomata. And the stomatas are going to be responsible for bringing in CO2 into the plant. okay, And also bringing in and out water. That's the most important part. Now, buds and seeds become dormant when this acid accumulates in them. And here you can see the chemical formula. Most of you don't care. Maybe if you're a chem nerd, um, you might have an opportunity to jot that down, but I wouldn't. Whew, we made it. Last slide. Last thing I want to bore you with today is ethylene. Ethylene is very, very common. Uh, as you can see there, C2H4. It is a PGR that is a simple gas. So it is in gas form and it promotes aging of tissues, such as the ripening of fruits. Now this is very common with fruit farmers, apples especially. And ethylene opposes many effects of auxin and cytokinins. So think about what those two do and think of how ethylene would cause a basically a growth factor. The hormone ethylene is responsible for ripening fruit. At room temperature, it is a gas and you kind of get this saying, one bad apple spoils the bushel, and that's based off of ethylene gas. So one rotting apple will produce ethylene gas, which stimulates neighboring apples to ripen and eventually spoil. So you have to be very, very careful with this process. It is a chain reaction. When ethylene is present, all the fruits around it will start to ripen. And if you don't get to them, they'll start to rot. So keep this in mind. That's everything for 11.4. I know it's a lot of information. Feel free to simplify your notes if you need any help doing that. See me. See a science teacher. That's all I got for 11.4. Yago out.